When asked what would be the sign of his second coming, Jesus replied that there would be wars and rumors of wars. We are witnessing this right now in Iran, North Korea, China, and around the world. Are we nearing the second coming? Absolutely. Well, the news is just hitting us from every side. So many developments are taking place. And all of them relate to the prophecies of the Bible in one way or another. I want to, first of all, uh, take you to the peace plan. I know we're all intensely interested because President Trump has put together the deal of the century. And they have been planning on releasing it just at any time. However, one thing after another has caused a delay. Well, now the announcement has been made and they say they're not changing it. Here's the story from Israel National News. We aren't planning to release the uh, revealing date of the peace plan. The U.S. State Department released a statement saying that they will not change the planned date for the release of the deal of the century regardless of the political situation in Israel. The release date for the economic portion of the plan is June 25th through the 26th at the conference in Bahrain. The U.N. will not attend the Bahrain Economic Conference because the UN does not approve of the US leading the peace talks. Nevertheless, this appears now to be a firm date just uh, 25 days or so from right now. Now, in addition to that, another story has developed. Israel, the United States, and Russia are planning a trilateral meeting in Jerusalem this month to discuss Syria. Israel wants Iran to be banished from Syria. As a matter of fact, Israel wants all of the foreign powers that were not in Syria prior to the Syrian civil war. Israel wants all of those to leave and everything to go back to the way as it was before the civil war began about eight years ago. This comes from the Jerusalem Post on the 30th of May. A trilateral Israeli, U.S., and Russian meeting of national security advisors is scheduled to take place in Israel in June to deal with regional security issues and is expected to focus on Iran's involvement in Syria. On Wednesday night, just before the Knesset decided to dissolve itself, the White House issued a statement saying that the U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, Israeli National Security Advisor Meir Ben Shabbat, and Russian Secretary of the Security Council Nikolay Petrushev will meet in Jerusalem in June to discuss regional security issues. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu mentioned the planned meeting in the agitated statement he gave after the Knesset vote, saying that these are the issues the country should be dealing with, not another round of elections. I proposed to U.S. President Donald Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin to form a U.S.-Russia-Israel trilateral committee 
that would meet in Jerusalem to discuss the security situation in the Middle East, and both of them agreed, Netanyahu said. This is unprecedented. A meeting like this has never taken place before in Israel. Never. Netanyahu said at the time that the objective of removing Iranian troops from Syria is not Israel's alone. He proposed setting up a team with others to promote the goal of removing all foreign forces on from Syrian soil and returning the situation regarding foreign troops to what it was before the start of the Syrian civil war. Now let's pause right here to note something. When Russia, the United States, and Israel get together in Jerusalem this month, could this meeting be a precursor to Russia and the U.S. working together to sponsor Middle East peace talks? Now, we know something is going to bring about a breakthrough. We know there's a peace agreement coming. We don't know for sure it's going to be Trump's peace agreement. But it's prophesied in the Bible it's going to happen. When it happens... This will mark the beginning of the final seven years to the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus to this earth. This will be the greatest prophetic fulfillment in the last 2,000 years. We've seen Bible prophecy fulfilled like never before. From the halls of the United Nations to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, End Time Ministries continues to reveal the Bible prophecy in the news headlines around the world every day. Whether it's through our broadcast or online at our Jerusalem Prophecy College, your gifts enable us to put vital materials in the hands of those who need it most. Because of you, we continue to replace fear with faith in the hearts of Christians around the world we will continue to see prophecy come to pass at an even swifter pace. We need your support. Your donation of any amount enables us to continue to broadcast and be a voice in the ever-growing censored media. To become a partner or give a one-time gift, visit endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME right now. That's 800-363-8463. Go online now. Visit endtime.com. Have you had a longing to visit the cities where Jesus healed, ministered, and taught every day? Judy and I would like to invite you to travel to the wonderful land of Israel. Experience the Word of God in vivid color while walking down the roads of the Holy Land with us. When you are ready to experience Israel, we recommend you travel with End Time Ministries. You will not only experience historical and present day Israel, you will also learn about the prophesied future to come. It's as if we traveled back in time to visit a different era and discovered ourselves in an ancient time. The tour is very well organized, the accommodations are first class, and the food is delicious. If you have ever had a desire to visit Israel, there is no better time than now. Anne from Colorado. To sign up to receive your Experience Israel 2019 packet, call Adrian or Jana at 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. We can't wait to experience Israel with you. Now, things are not remaining the same in Israel right now. Things are continuing to develop. Over the last year or two, the Israeli police are starting to tighten down and no longer are they allowing these spontaneous riots that the Arabs like to put on every th time something happens that they do not agree with. Consequently, the Arabs realize a shift is taking place and the Jews realize it as well. Now, let me bring you up to date because I've been to Israel every single year over, ever since 1993. I've watched the shift happen. Back in 1993, our tours could go to the Temple Mount. We could go through the Al-Aqsa Mosque and through the Dome of the Rock. That's no longer allowed. Now, we couldn't even go onto the Temple Mount for two or three years. Everything was frozen. Then it opened 
back up. However, when it opened back up, we could no longer go to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, nor could we go to the Dome of the Rock, but we still can visit the Temple Mount. Back in those times, I'm talking about the early 2000s, you saw no Jews on the Temple Mount. Their rabbis had taught them that they should not go there. And furthermore, there was a lot of pressure for them not to go there. But over time, some of the rabbis said, you know, several thousand Arabs go up, Muslims go up to worship on the Temple Mount. And they're sending a message to the world, no Jews ever go. It's as though we don't even care about this place. We're afraid that if we don't start visiting the Temple Mount, that the message will be transmitted that we don't really care. Consequently, certain rabbis begin to say, you can go up, just stay away from the location of the Holy of Holies and the temple itself. So little by little, they begin to go up. You would see clusters of five or ten, and that happened uh, for several years. But then it began to build. There were organizations put together to actually encourage Jews to go up to the Temple Mount. Now, they said we must go up. Well, after a while, sometimes there would be 100 per day. Then it increased to 500 until it became commonplace. The Arabs tried to stop it, but the Jewish police kept tightening down the screws on any counter demonstrations. Now, they allowed the Muslims to worship there. They didn't interfere with their visits or with their worships. But when they tried to interfere with Jewish visits, that's when the Israeli police came down stronger and stronger and stronger. So what has developed to right now? In 2017, there were 16,000 Jews that visited the Temple Mount over the period of one year. 2018, there were 18,000 Jews that visited the Temple Mount in the first six months. So Jewish visitation on the Temple Mount is increasing exponentially. The Arabs know that. They feel that happening to them. Consequently, normally during the month of Ramadan, Jews don't go up to the Temple Mount because Ramadan is the holiest month of the year for the Muslims. And then the last days of Ramadan, that's when as high as 250,000 Muslims come to worship on the Temple Mount in a single day. However, the last days of Ramadan this year coincided with Jerusalem Day. Jerusalem Day is a big deal to the Jews. That's when they celebrate the reunification of Jerusalem in the 1967 war. So the Jews insisted on going up. Now the dilemma. When the Jews went up, the Arabs began to throw chairs and rocks. Immediately, the Israeli police moved in squashed the riots, and before long, once again, the Jews were visiting on Jerusalem Day on the Temple Mount. I've got the story here. Let me just give some of it to you. Arabs riot as Jews are allowed to enter the Temple Mount on Jerusalem Day. This comes from the Jerusalem Post uh, just yesterday. Following the report that Jews will be allowed to enter the Temple Mount for Jerusalem Day, riots broke out on the Temple Mount on Sunday, according to the police spokesperson's unit. The commander of the Jerusalem District, Major General Doran Yedid, ordered the police to enter the Temple Mount and take care of the rioters. As the police attempted to enter the place, Arab worshipers began throwing stones, chairs, and other objects at the forces. The forces responded with riot dispersal means. 
Jews are generally forbidden to enter the compound during the last days of the month of Ramadan. The police, however, allowed the entrance of Jews, especially for Jerusalem Day. After the riots subsided, Jews slowly began entering the area. Now, why are we looking at this today? Because the Bible prophesies that the Temple Mount is going to be placed under a sharing arrangement once this peace agreement is signed so that both Jews and Muslims will be allowed to worship there. The Jews will even be allowed to build their third temple on the Temple Mount without disturbing the Dome of the Rock or the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is all prophesied in the Bible. So as we see Israel becoming more and more assertive and stopping the riots. As we see those things, it's an indicator that we're moving in the direction that the Bible says is going to happen. Now, along with these developments, and all of this relates between Russia and Israel and the United States meeting in Jerusalem and the pushing of the Trump peace plan later on this month in Bahrain. And by the way, Saudi Arabia is going to be there, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, and Israel is going to be there. So these things are moving forward in spite of the strong opposition being put forward by the Palestinians in particular. Well, along with these developments, there are parallel developments in other areas of prophetic fulfillment that we need to take a look at. For example, an article just appeared entitled, Pope Pleas for European Unity Says Ideologies Threaten Its Existence. This comes from Reuters just yesterday. The Pope, Pope Francis, made an impassioned plea for Europe to stick together and revive the ideals of its founders on Sunday, saying ideologies and fear-mongering politicians were threatening its very existence as a bloc. The Pope's comments to journalists on the plane while returning from a three-day trip to Romania, one of the more recent European Union members, were his first since European elections were held last month. Francis, who was asked about the elections, Italian far-right leader Mario Salvini and other European topics, urged believers to pray for European unity and non-believers to hope for it from the bottom of your hearts. Now let's pause there just a moment. Why is the Pope so concerned with European unity? There's a good reason why. The Bible prophesies the rebirth of the Holy Roman Empire. That actually has now taken place as of November the 3rd of 2009. So 28 nations, the 28 nations of Europe have all converged together, first of all, under what was called the common market, and later on it has become known as the European Union because it's now far beyond a common market. It has become a political union. They now have their own constitution, and they also have a president and a foreign minister. So they're moving toward a United States of Europe right now, and the Pope realizing that these last elections had produced somewhat of a backlash because some of the members of the European Union don't like the loss of national sovereignty that they're presently experiencing. The exit of Britain from the European Union has stirred up some of these nationalistic feelings. Others of the nations are saying, maybe we should exit the European Union as well. So now the Pope is trying to countermand that and to get the people to continue on with the process of the total unification of the nations of Europe so that the European Union will actually become a nation in its own right. 
So that's what we're experiencing here. The article goes on to say, the far right and nationalists in Italy, Britain, France, and Poland came out on top in their national votes, shaking up politics at home, but failing to dramatically alter the balance of pro-European power in the EU assembly. Okay, now let's pause there because many people are reporting, oh, the nationalists won, they're throwing the, uh, the people that want to be globalists, they're throwing them out of office. That's not true. It is true that the nationalists made some gains, but they didn't come close to shaking the pro-European stranglehold on power. They are still very much in power. Such people as Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, uh, Angela Merkel, the prime minister, the chancellor of Germany, and others. They're very much there continuing to push for European unification. Now that's so important because the Bible prophesies European unification. And furthermore, it's important because the Bible prophesies that the Antichrist and the false prophet will come out of this present rise of European unification. That shows you how close we are to the end time. So when you have the Pope making an impassioned plea, everyone pray that European unification will continue to go forward. It's because in the Holy Roman Empire, since it was first established in 800 AD, the Pope has always played a central role. There have always been two leaders, a political leader and a spiritual leader. The political leader has always been the most powerful and popular uh, politician from Europe. The spiritual leader has always been the Pope from Rome. That's the reason that it's been called for the last thousand years, the Holy Roman Empire. We are watching the reascendancy of the Holy Roman Empire right now. The Pope knows this, and that's the reason he is appealing to people to uh, pray that this process will continue because he understands that if this European Union can come together as it has been together over the last thousand years, that it can actually become the dominant force for the world. And the Bible tells us that is in fact going to happen for a short period of time in the near future. The political leader that will end up leaving the Holy Roman Empire, he will be called in your Bible the beast or the antichrist. The spiritual leader is going to be the false prophet. So we're watching all of these things taking place right now. And that's the reason I wanted you to take a look at this article. The article goes on to say, someone could ask under their breath, is this perhaps the end of a 70 year adventure? He said, now, why is he talking about a 70 year adventure? Because in 1957, the common market was formed. It then ended up being a total union of economies by 1992. They then switched to trying to produce political union. And that process has been ongoing since that time. One of the big keys of that process has been the adoption of a common money. Many of the nations of the European Union have now adopted the euro for their money. So they're moving together more and more. The power is moving out of the states and into the European Union. That's the reason the Pope is so anxious that this, these elections that just took place where the globalist experienced a temporary setback, he's praying, let's not lose the momentum that we've had in this 70 year experiment because it started in 1957 and here we are in 2019. It's a little bit over 70 years. The Pope went on to say, Europe had to again take up the mysticism of its founding fathers and overcome divisions and borders. Does that sound familiar? 
we have the same argument taking place here in the United States of America. They're saying we should overcome divisions and borders. We should all have a global society. There's a big debate between globalism and national sovereignty in our country right now. And I'm sure it will be one of the central issues in the next election. The Pope went on to say, please, let's not let Europe be overcome by pessimism or by ideologies because Europe is not being attacked by cannons or bombs in this moment, but by ideologies, ideologies that are not European, that come either from outside, he's referring to the United States, or which stem from small groups in Europe, he said. Francis urged Europeans to remember how the continent was divided and belligerent in the years leading up to both world wars in the 20th century. Please, let's not return to the conditions that caused those two major wars. Let's learn from history. Let's not fall into the same hole. That's what the Pope is speaking to Europe right now. And it's so interesting when we see all this developing. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says there will be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in different places, many upheavals. We're experiencing that right now. The disciples had asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus said, don't let any man deceive you because these things will happen prior to my second coming. They're happening right now. We are approaching the second coming of Jesus Christ. We all have to educate ourselves in the prophecies of the Bible. If you're not yet a student to the Jerusalem Prophecy College, do it immediately. All you have to do is go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com, register and enroll in your first course. It will educate you so all of this, you'll understand it completely. It will not take you by surprise. And that's gonna really be important because the end time has arrived. You and I are in the end time right now. Stay with us, we'll be back. Move Mountains with Irvin Baxter. This book by Irvin's grandson provides 30 days of devotion that will enhance your relationship with God and others. Authentic illustrations from early morning devotions at end time will help you find your purpose and eliminate fears. Commit to taking this 30-day journey and experience real life change. Get your book for only $14.99. Call 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com slash move. If ever people needed to hear the unvarnished truth, it is now. There are some subjects that are not politically correct to talk about, but they're urgent. That's why I'm grateful for End Time Magazine. If you're not a subscriber, you're missing information that will impact your life. End Time has a bi-monthly magazine that explains how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. You can get a two-year subscription for only $29. You can also get a bulk subscription and pass them out to your church. We have gotten reports that End Time Magazine has caused spiritual awakenings in churches when they see the prophecies being fulfilled right now. You can start your own ministry and lead them in doctor's offices, libraries, laundromats. You never know if you might be responsible for saving someone who is searching for the unvarnished truth. That's what the magazine has done in many lives. Call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. And get your subscription today. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archive button. We will be taking your calls in this segment of the program. However, before we do that, I have one more article I want to present to you. This article is entitled, Beijing Warns U.S. Not to Underestimate Chinese Military. Beijing warned Friday that the U.S. should not underestimate China's military as the top defense officials from both countries met on the sidelines of a security forum. As Beijing and Washington vie for influence in a region hosting potential flashpoints such as the South China Sea, Korean Peninsula, 
and the Taiwan Strait. Acting U.S. Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan met with Chinese Defense Minister General Wei Feng for 20 minutes on Friday. Chinese Defense Ministry spokesman Wu Quan said they reached some consensus on issues of common concern, adding that Wei particularly emphasized the Taiwan issue. Taiwan, China sees Taiwan as part of its territory to be reunified despite the two sides having been ruled separately since the end of the Civil War on the mainland in 1949. So we're talking about 70 years now. These two entities have been separate nations. Now, beyond that, Taiwan was ruled by Japan from 1905 until 1949. That's when the communists swept through mainland China, defeated Chiang Kai-shek. He was forced to flee to the island called Formosa at the time. Today it's called Taiwan. And there he set up what was called Free China. Well, that's taken place. So since 1905, mainland China has not controlled Taiwan. And yet here we are 120 years later. China still claims, oh, that belongs to us. It doesn't belong to them whatsoever. But the fact that Chinese went to from mainland China to Taiwan in order to escape communist domination, they see that as a problem, a discrediting of their power and authority. And so they continually claim that uh, Taiwan must reunify with the mainland. Now recently, uh, uh, Taiwan elected an independence-minded uh, president and that has caused the conflict between Taiwan and Beijing to increase. Now, in the meantime, the Taiwan Straits separate Taiwan from the mainland. I think it's about 80 miles wide. China claims authority over this entire course, but U.S. warships continue to go through there without permission. Let me just give you the details. Beijing is regularly and angered by U.S. warships transiting through the Taiwan Strait, which it considers its territorial waters. Defense Minister Wei pointed out that the U.S. has recently had a series of negative words and actions on this issue. Wu said, adding that Beijing was firmly opposed to this. On the issue of safeguarding national sovereignty and territory integrity, the U.S. should not underestimate the determination, will, and ability of the Chinese military. Now let's pause just a moment. Because China has been running huge trade surpluses ever since 1980. They have been averaging 10% growth per year huge surpluses. With America alone, they run about a $500 billion surplus per year. What are they doing with all of this excess money? They have been building warships. They have been building missiles, uh, airports, armies, air force, many things. But, well, because they had all this money to spend, they have built themselves very strong military, militarily and they're warning America, don't underestimate our military might. Now, according to recent articles I have read, China claims to have intercontinental ballistic missiles equipped with nuclear weapons that can reach every major city in America. Now, that's alarming to all of us this article goes on to say Washington has been pushing back against Beijing's militarization 
of the South China Sea. And ahead of Friday's meeting, Shanahan told reporters that facilities uh, in China, that China was building on reclaimed land in the South China Sea appeared to be an overkill if they were purely defensive. Now, what's going on here? China has gone out and they have built up islands that didn't even exist between them and Taiwan. And then once they build these islands, they declare all around this 25 miles is Chinese territory because these islands now are part of China. So what they're now doing, they're building surface-to-air missiles, long runways. And these, these new developments, according to Mr. Shanahan, seems to be excessive. A top U.S. general said earlier this week that Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping had reneged on promises by building 10,000-foot runways, ammunition storage facilities, routine deployment of missile defense capabilities, aviation capabilities on these reclaimed islands, these reclaimed lands. Definitively, we are seeing more competition between the U.S. and China, not just traditional fields, but also in technology. And I think this is something that we have to watch very carefully. That statement was made by Mr. Ho, who is Singapore's prime minister. Uh, let me back up. Singapore's prime minister, Lee Sein Long, said in a keynote speech to the gathering Friday evening, and we're talking about uh, three or four days ago, the U.S.-China bilateral relationship is the most important in the world today, urging them to work together. Even short of outright conflict, a prolonged period of tension and uncertainty will be extremely damaging, he warned, adding that serious international problems would not be addressed without the full participation of both powers. Now, this isn't even mentioning the trade conflict that we're presently in with China. <coughs> Because China has been running a trade surplus with the U.S. of $500 billion over the last many years, and because our leaders have accepted that and done nothing about it, and then all of a sudden President Trump says, wait a minute, we can't keep going this direction. We've got to balance our trade with you. So he's trying to negotiate these things, but the Chinese are not wanting to budge. This is ca causing a lot of conflict between America and China right now. Now add this to the military tensions that are coming to the surface, and it does produce a dangerous situation, especially since we uh, know that the Bible prophesies a great war that's going to kill one-third of mankind. China has 1.3 billion people. And if another country such as India with 1.3 billion, those two countries together would be 2.5 billion. That means that would be one-third of the human race. Now, when we talk about this, we do it with dread and with great reservations. But... This war is coming. You can read about it in Revelation chapter number 9, verse 13 through 16. Actually, if you want to read the whole account, it's all the way down to verse 21. That's Revelation 9, verse 13 through 21. You can read about the war that will kill one-third part of mankind. It's a sobering prophecy, but it's in your Bible. It's in mine. The prophecies always come to pass, and we should never doubt that. All right, it's time to come to the phones right now. And we want to move very quickly. Uh, first of all, we want to go to Oklahoma. 
Steve is calling from Oklahoma. Hello, Steve. Welcome. Hello, Pastor Baxter. It's been a long time, and it's good to be back on the air. Well, thank you very much. What's on your mind today? All right, I've got a couple questions, and then maybe one lighthearted question if we have time and everything. But first two questions is about the whole thing that I recently saw. It was either yesterday or the day before. I woke up, and a headline on Fox News said, Israel to have new elections again. I was just wanting to know, is that true or has that uh, been proven false? And if so, uh, when they have the new election, I personally don't see Ben Netanyahu getting reelected. And if, that, if he does get elected, who do you think would possibly be the person to succeed Ben and take over as the new prime minister? Well, Steve, first of all, you're breaking up on me just a little bit, but I think I got the essence of your question. There were new elections held on April the 9th of this past year. Then uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu attempted to put together a coalition in order to have a majority so that he could establish a government. He needed 60 uh, seats in the Knesset plus one. He could get 60, but Avigdor Lieberman of a party, it's called Our Home Party. Uh, he had control of five seats and he refused to become part of the coalition unless Netanyahu began to draft the religious uh, people, young men of Israel. The religious faction made up a very strong part of Netanyahu's coalition and they said, no, we're not going to agree with that. So after negotiating for over 30 days, they still could not come to an agreement. The time was up. So Netanyahu's only choice was to uh, vote to dissolve the Knesset, which triggers another election. Those elections are now scheduled to be held on September the 17th. So you're absolutely right. They're in the middle of an election campaign right now. Somehow Netanyahu, if he wants to continue as prime minister, he will need to win this next election and need to have enough votes to be able to establish a government. However, the same problem still exists. Lieberman still says, I will not become a part of a government uh, if you do not treat the religious faction like we treat everybody else. The religious say, we're not going to allow you to draft us. Our boys need to be studying Torah all day, every day. And so we don't know how that's going to turn out. Now, I've got some more comments about it. However, we're up against a break right now. I'll comment more as soon as we get back. You're listening to End of the Age, and we'll be back in just a moment. Many Christians admit end-time Bible prophecy is very complex and difficult to understand, and for some, a little bit scary. But what if you could understand Bible prophecy? What if you could know what will happen and how the United States will play a key role during end-time events? When you call today and get Understanding the End Time DVD Curriculum, you can have peace about what is to come while understanding the prophetic events that appear in our headlines every day. When you call or go online to endtime.com and order, you'll learn the answer to the biggest prophecy question of all. Will the rapture take place and when will it happen? This 14-part DVD series is the definitive End Time Prophecy Bible study available. And for this limited time, you can get it for just $149. Don't miss this special offer. Understanding the End Time. Call now. 1-800-363-8463. That's 1-800-END-TIME. Or go to endtime.com today. Before our break, Steve from Oklahoma was asking about the elections in Israel. They will be held on September the 17th. There's no way to know today who will win those elections. The polls are saying that Netanyahu and the right will have the majority, but will they have the majority without Avigdor Lieberman? All the predictions say that Netanyahu will gain a couple of votes, but that still won't be enough to establish a government without Lieberman. The 
polls are also saying that Lieberman is going to gain some votes due to what he just did uh, withstanding Netanyahu in the last negotiations. I do not know who is going to win the next election. I do not know who will be the prime minister. However, whoever does, we're still moving toward a peace agreement. Now, the blue and white, which is the other major party that's very close in size to the Likud party, they're planning on hoping to win this election and to be able to put together a coalition. They are more willing to trade land for peace than Netanyahu and the right wing is. There is a chance that something could happen that they could end up in power. Again, right today, it's impossible to predict. But the implications right now when Trump is presenting his plan, the 25th of this month, he's presenting the economic half of his plan. Once that is presented, it could produce such excitement that the other part of the plan will be presented right away. So whichever side in Israeli product, pro, uh, politics would come out and say, we'll sign that plan, we'll cooperate, that could flip the election in their favor. Again, this is all speculation. We don't know for sure, Steve. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. We appreciate the phone call. Let's go now to Florida. Donald is calling from Florida. Hello, Donald. Yes, uh, Brother Baxter, I have a question. Hopefully it won't be uh, too long of an answer. But in the uh, newsletter I just got, uh, you talked about the prophecy with a date attached. And in da Daniel 9.27, you said it's, it's concerns the final seven years. And then you list about five different items that I guess that uh, would be have to be in the peace agreement to fulfill that prophecy. And I was wondering, how in the world did you get all of those points? Well, the Bible actually says these different things. The Bible teaches that uh, Jesus gave a prophecy that the Jews living in Judea would have to run for their lives three and a half years after the peace agreement. Well, there are 850,000 Jews in Judea, but Judea is the area that the Palestinians say they have to have for their new state. In addition to that, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2 shows a picture of, the, John was told, measure the temple, but don't measure the outer court of the temple. Measure the temple and those that worship therein. Well, right now there is no temple on the Temple Mount. That shows us that as a result of this peace agreement, Israel will build her temple and they will be worshiping in that temple. But John was told, don't measure the outer court. So that paints a picture of the mm -hmm. outer court being trodden down the Gentiles all during this time. So I took the different prophecies of the Bible and put the pieces together. And that's the reason I came up. That's the way I came up with that information. Okay. In other words, I, okay, that's what I thought it was from several scriptures, just not that one verse, but Here's a, another real quick question. I heard, I've read in some word that this Judea actually uh, represents the West Bank. Yes, you're talking about the same thing. Judea, Samaria is the biblical name for it. Today the news calls it the West Bank, the West Bank of the Jordan River. Well, does that mean that all of this, the people in the West Bank, when this happens, something terrible is going to happen to that particular area? Yes, the Bible tells us that the first three and a half years, everything will appear to be okay. They're going to say, okay, we've got 850,000 Jews living out here. Do we have to pick them all up and drag them from their homes kicking and screaming? No. They can stay there living as a Jewish minority under the new Palestinian state. After all, we've got 1.6 million Arabs living as an Arab minority in the Jewish state, so why can't we have the same thing on the other side? Well, they're going to agree to that. However, halfway through when the abomination of desolation takes place, there's going to be something about that that's going to trigger Palestinian anger. And that Jesus prophesied about it in, in Matthew 24, verse 15 through 21. He said, when you see the abomination of desolation, let those which be in Judea 
flee for their lives. If you're on the housetop, don't even come down to get your clothes. If you're in the field, don't run back to grab your billfold. Hit the ground running because then will be great tribulation such as never been before nor ever again shall be. So there's going to be a huge slaughter of Jews in the West Bank, and that's the reason we at End Time are planning on taking a 1,000 people six months before that time comes up and knocking every door out there in that Jewish, uh, every Jewish door, warning them that they have to get out. And if they will listen, they will escape unharmed. That's what we're hoping will happen. Some of them will listen. Apparently, some of them will not. Wow. Well, thank you so very much. Oh, want to let you know, I have enrolled in your Bible college, and as I go... Through these studies, I'm sure I'll learn even more and have more questions. That's great, Donald. I appreciate you doing that so much. And I wish every single one of our listeners would do it because to me, that will really get us ready for the times that are just ahead. You know, I, I said in the newsletter that the prophecy of Daniel 9:27 is the prophecy with a timeline attached to it. When they sign this peace agreement that's prophesied in the Bible, it will mark the beginning of the final seven years. That seven years is going to be jam-packed with prophetic fulfillment. And to all of you that are enrolled in the college, that get through the college, complete it, you're not going to be surprised because we outline everything in detail that's going to be happening. And you'll be able to minister to your family, your friends, your neighbors, your churches. And that's the reason I continually push, if you're not yet enrolled in the Jerusalem Prophecy College, do it immediately. JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. Go there and you'll, it's so easy to do and you will love it. I promise you we're getting such wonderful remarks about it. Okay, let's go on now. Let's go to uh, Ken from Indiana. Hello, Ken. You're on the end of the age. Hi, Brother Baxter. Hello. Uh, my question is concerning the uh, Six Trumpet War and the uh, Peace Treaty. Yes. Uh, if I may follow up, Donald, though, uh, I'm getting ready to start the eighth semester at the Jerusalem Prophet College. Now, I recommend it for everybody because I'm not going to be surprised at all. I'm not surprised what's going on now. Well, that's um, great, uh, Ken, and congratulations on doing that. And we're hoping everybody gets through it before the thing comes down uh, because that way we'll be ready to do God's work and uh, we'll be equipped. Yes, sir. Now, my question is, I know the uh, Bible doesn't state which comes first, the Sixth Trumpet War or the Peace Treaty. Uh, so I'm, I guess I'm asking for your thought on this. My, my feeling is, is it would almost seem kind of weird to sign the Peace Treaty and then have the Sixth Trumpet War. I, my... my Spirit kind of troubles me. I kind of feel like uh, as they roll out this peace treaty, that it may spark the Sixth Trumpet War. And then when everything, they see how bad everything is, they go, well, we better go back to this peace treaty and, and come up with some kind of settlement here. Yeah, like you say, Ken, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly whether it will happen before the peace agreement or afterwards. But there's some reasons to think perhaps that the war would happen afterwards because once the peace agreement is signed and implemented, not everybody's going to like it. And if this war would then break out, it may not involve Israel and the Palestinians because the Bible says it's going to come from the Euphrates River, which is about a thousand miles away from Israel. And when that war breaks out, uh, the devastation is going to be so massive with one-third of mankind killed, we're talking about 2.5 billion people, that that could easily be the entrance ramp for the Antichrist to rise to power. And we know he will be revealed halfway through the final seven years. So I can't tell you today whether it will come before the peace agreement or afterwards. However, all we can do is be ready. Very good. Thank you very much. And uh, I just declare that your call be gone, sir. In the name of Jesus. Well, thank you. Thank you I very am, much, sir. I am somewhat better. I'm still wrestling with it. Thank you all for your patience out there. Let's now go to Florida. Jim is calling from Florida. Hello, Jim. Irvin, how you doing, sir? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've been praying for you and asking the Lord to heal your throat. And uh, maybe you should let Dave take the reins for a bit and give yourself a little convalescent time. And, uh, hey, uh, you're talking about China and all sorts of things. I had some questions. I was going to talk about the very worst president and right after the very best president. But um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 55, he put Novus Otis Eclorum on the back of the dollar bill. 
All right. So they already knew what they were going to do. Just like in Belgium, they know what they're going to do with this new world order. They know what they're doing. They knew, we knew what we were doing back then. So what's going on? I mean, all ever since Frank, Franklin Delano Roosevelt up until Obama, this has been going on. All of a sudden, we have Donald Trump, and he wants to put the borders up. He's going to secure this country, keep our sovereignty. He's changing everything so fast. And, and, and I believe God put him here, of course, for such a time as this. And it's just amazing how God just changes things, just like he did with Hitler when he, he said that you're falling into a trap, like you said. And, he, and then he, he stopped the blitzkrieg and allowed them 600,000 troops to escape over back across the channel to save them. So Yeah, listen, Jim, we're about, out of, we're about out of time, so let me respond to what you're saying. Yeah. You mentioned... Uh, Novus Ordo Seclorum on the back of our dollar bill. Most people don't know what that means. That's Latin for New World Order. Novus is the word for new. Ordo is order. Seclorum is secular or world. So like you mentioned, Franklin D. Roosevelt already had dreams of a one world government. He was the driving force behind the establishment of the United Nations. So they have been planning a one world government since World War II. They actually been planning it before that time and we've been moving towards it. However, President Trump has come along and said, we don't want to be a part of a global government. We want to retain the sovereignty of the United States of America. So he has been reversing everything and the nations of the world are having a nervous breakdown. They're saying, you are tearing down everything we've accomplished over the last 70 years. You are breaking up our global plan for a global government. So that is what is indeed going on right now. Uh, tell you what, let me, I'm going to try to take one more call real fast from Kuwait. Um, Nizu is calling from Kuwait. Hello, Nizu. Hello, Dr. Baxter. Yes. How are you doing? Yes. Uh, see, uh, Dr. Baxter, my question is, see, if the peace covenant, I mean, the deal of the century proposed by Donald Trump is signed and it meets all the conditions of the peace treaty, which is basically uh, seven years and, you know, the sharing agreement and the temple being built, so if it meets all the conditions, then it would be the deal which is prophesied by Daniel in 9.27. Right. He will make a covenant with many. Right. So in that case, who would be the Antichrist? And mm -hmm. I know you have said that it should be somebody from Europe, but maybe we could be wrong and because, you know, U.S. is a country of immigrants. So could it be that one of the persons who's responsible for the peace treaty is the Antichrist? Since we're about out That's of time, let me ask you quickly, Nizu. Um, it cannot be anybody from America because America, according to Revelation 12, 14, is the eagle that protects Israel from the Antichrist all during the final three and a half years. Uh, like you mentioned, the scripture says that the Antichrist will confirm the covenant with many. Many people will be attending the conference in Bahrain uh, on the 25th of this month. And many people will be participating probably before it's over with. We'll have Russia, the United Nations, the European Union, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, many others are going to be participating. So we may not know when the peace agreement is signed, which of those will be the Antichrist. The Bible tells us the Antichrist will be revealed uh, at the time of the abomination of desolation. Sorry I'm out of time. Got to let you go. We're over time right now. God bless you all, and we'll see you again tomorrow. This has been End of the Age, brought to you by the faithful partners of End Time Ministries. If you're not currently a partner with End Time Ministries, or if you would like more information, we invite you to call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463, or visit us online at endtime.com.